News of the Times. Sinister Saturdays. The Stansfield Hall Murders. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, it is 1848 in Norfolk. A lone gunman wearing a cape and a mask has entered Stansfield Hall and begun shooting at everyone he can as an attempt of utter annihilation of the family. The Jeremy family have made two deadly enemies. One was within the family and involved a dispute as to who had ownership of the considerable estate. And the second deadly enemy was James Bloomfield Rush. Rush worked as an auctioneer in land amongst other roles. He was a tenant of Jeremy's, owning a piece of land he had gotten in a slightly shady way. He owned the property, but for supposed improvements he had borrowed large sums of money from Isaac Jeremy. That mortgage was now coming due, and he did not have the money. Isaac had already informed his solicitor to begin foreclosure proceedings against Russ, which would essentially bankrupt Rush and make him homeless. In November 1848, a cloaked a masked and armed man appears within Stansfield Hall and begins shooting with an intention of annihilating the whole family. This case, with its twists and turns, was considered unprecedented, with a lone gunman going into a house with an aim to kill every member of the family and any servants who got in the way. We look at the background, the crime, the capture and the trial of the Stansfield Hall murders from 1848 in today's episode of Sinister Saturdays. We hope you enjoy the show. It is the 28th of November at around 8 in the evening. Mr Jeremy, as was usual for him, steps outside onto the porch for a few minutes before retiring to bed. Suddenly the stillness of the night is broken by a sharp report of a rifle. Mr Jeremy Senior, 68 years old, slumps to the porch, dead. His son, Mr Isaac Jeremy Jr., checks to see what the noise was. He too is instantly shot, dead. From here, all is chaos, as the unknown gunman, cloaked and with a mask on his face, enters Stansfield Mansion and begins shooting. He seems to be taking particular aim at the Jeremy family members, although servants who are in his way are shot at too. From the Essex Standard, the 1st of December, 1848, the horrible assassination of the recorder of Norwich and his family. We had a terrible and horrible occurrence in our neighbourhood last evening at Stansfield Hall, near Windmundham, the residence of Isaac Jeremy Esquire recorder of Norwich. At about eight o'clock that gentleman went out and was immediately shot dead by some villain who was lying in wait for him. Mr Jeremy Jr., hearing the report, went to ascertain the cause and was also shot and died immediately. The younger Mrs Jeremy was the next victim being shot in the shoulder. The servants ran out to see what the firing meant and when the insatiable miscreant fired at a female servant who is dangerously wounded. It was at first conjectured that the crime might have been committed by someone connected with an unsuccessful claim made on Mr Jeremy's property some years since, but suspicion attaches more strongly to a farmer and land agent named James B. Rush, who lives at Stanfield. This person, some time since, hired a farm of Mr. Jeremy, but refused to farm it according to the covenants. Mr. Jeremy, therefore, as was thought by many very roughly, ejected him, and he is supposed to have taken this desperate vengeance. The villain has concealed his features with a black cape, but we understand the servants all believe Rush to be the man. He was taken into custody on Wednesday morning and was in to be examined the same day. 
The dreadful extent of the crime and the influential position of the chief victim have caused the greatest excitement throughout the county. Background. To understand how things have gotten to so desperate an action, we must look at the background of the family and the relations. The Jeremy family. The family living in Stansfield Hall include Mr. Jeremy Senior, 69 years of age. He also held the important position of recorder for the county. Mr. Jeremy, who formerly held the name Pearson, took on the mantle of Jeremy at the death of his father when he took over the estates. He is a widower with one daughter. Miss Isabella Jeremy, the daughter of Mr. Jeremy Senior, and Mr. Isaac Jeremy Junior, 30 years of age. It seems he to have overseen the majority of the management of the estate. He was described as stern and rather unforgiving, and some of his actions against tenants were deemed harsh by those living in the neighbourhood. Mrs. Jeremy is married to Mr. Jeremy Junior. Mr. James Rush. Mr. Rush is recounted in the papers as someone who skims the right side of the law. No actual malfeasance is attached to him, although there are suspected incidents that are unofficially laid at his door. From the Essex Standard on the 8th of December 1848, the murders at Stansfield Hall, Norfolk. James Rush has long been well known in that part of the county, having been for many years a farmer and land agent, to which he added, till within the last four or five years, the business of auctioneer. James Bloomfield, after his mother's marriage, always went by the name of Rush. He married early in the life of a lady of Aylsham and occupied a farm in that parish under Mr Pittman. From thence he removed to Wooddulling, where he rented a farm. A fire took place on this farm during his occupation, which he was suspected of having caused. He was tried for arson and acquitted. From Wooddulling he removed to Wymundham where he farmed nearly 500 acres under Mr. Jeremy, the father of the current Mr. Jeremy Senior, who had so much confidence in him that he appointed him his bailiff or steward. He also occupied a farm at Felmingham, the property of Mr. Jeremy, and the potash farm at Hethel, which is his own property but was mortgaged to Mr. Jeremy. Things went on very comfortable until October the 5th, 1847, when distresses were put on the farms, and ultimately Mr. Jeremy Senior obtained possession of the Stansfield Hall farm, and also in an action against Rush for breach of covenant, obtained a verdict, the damages and costs amounting to £177. Rush's lease of the farm at Felmingham expired at Michaelmas in 1848 and he ought to have given it up, but he refused, and a distress was issued. He resisted it, but ultimately paid the money. Rush has been twice married. Both his wives are dead, but he has a large family, it is said, of nine children. One of his sons lives at the Potash farm, but he and his brothers and sisters were not at home on Tuesday evening. There is another point of contention between Rush and Jeremy. Rush had been a tenant of Jeremy's father for several years. Upon his death, the estate was taken over by his son. Jeremy Sr. is said to have found the lease agreements between the family and Rush illegal. Consequently, new legal agreements regarding the renting of property were drawn up, but the rates were considerably higher with the son than they had been with his father. Rush resented this. Fighting this in the courts would have been difficult for Rush. Jeremy Senior was the recorder of the county, a highly prestigious position. Thomas Larimer, a distant relation to Mr. Jeremy Senior, he was in a contentious relationship 
with the Germy family in stating that the estate rightfully belonged to him. There were very little credence given to this. However, the killer left notices in the hall at the killings in an attempt to throw suspicion on him as the murderer. From the Essex Standard on the 8th of December, 1848. The murders at Stansfield Hall in Norfolk. Mr. Jeremy had given instructions to his solicitor, Mr. Clark, to foreclose the mortgage of Rush. Thomas Lama, a distant relation to the Prestons, recently took the name of Thomas Jeremy and after last Michaelmas issued circulars claiming the Stansfield estate and stating that Mr. Rush and others were his tenants and requesting them to pay no rent except to him. It is believed that Rush's motive for scattering threatening papers in the hall on the night of the murders was to cause suspicion to fall on the former who had set up a claim to the property. There are two main suspects in the killings, the distant relation attempting to take control of the estate and James Bloomfield Rush, whose multiple loans are coming due and who is very near to being homeless at the hands of the Jeremy family. From the Essex Standard on the 8th of December, 1848. The murders at Stansfield Hall, Norfolk. Mr. Jeremy repeated and said that he would give anything to get rid of him, Rush. And about ten years since the Pot Ash Farm was advertised to be sold by auction, Mr. Rush was then Mr. Jeremy's principal tenant, and Mr. Jeremy placed great confidence in him. Having received Mr. Jeremy's instruction, Rush took a person with him to look over the farm, and he gave in his estimate of the value of the property at £3,500. Mr. Jeremy told Rush to buy the farm for him at that sum. Rush went to the auction and bid £3,000. For five hundred pounds for Mr. Jeremy and three thousand six hundred pounds for himself, he then informed Mr. Jeremy that he meant to keep the farm for himself. Mr. Jeremy was naturally very angry, but he did not think it worthwhile to dispute the matter, being sure that he should have the farm some time or other. Strange to say, Mr. Jeremy was afterwards induced to lend Rush to buy the farm on mortgages for seven years. During that period, he borrowed more money on the farm to the amount of £5,500. This sum was due on Friday last. The crime. The crime itself is shocking in its day and was clearly a planned annihilation of the family. Mr. Jeremy Sr. is shot while standing outside. His son, Mr. Jeremy Jr., is shot in the hall as he goes to check on his father. Mrs. Jeremy's arm is shattered by gunshot and there are fears it will have to be amputated. Her maid, Elizabeth Chesney, is seriously wounded as she had arrived to help Mrs. Jeremy upon hearing her cry for help. It is uncertain whether she will survive. Young Miss Jeremy escapes harm, as does the cook and the butler who hides in his pantry. Fortunately, with the cries for help and the sharp retort of the rifle fire, a servant escapes the house and flees by horseback, appealing for help. The response is immediate as county police swoop in at the house. The killer, however, has managed to escape. The shocked servants are questioned separately, as is the stunned Mrs. Jeremy. Although the killer was cloaked and masked, all say the same thing. It was Mr. James Rush. From the Essex Standard on the 8th of December, 1848, the murders at Stanfield Hall, Norfolk. The county magistrates and the coroner have been busily engaged in conducting a rigid inquiry into the circumstances of the assassination. The magistrates conducted their investigation with closed doors, but it is understood that the disclosures made before them 
hourly increases in importance and a remarkable concurrence of circumstances has tended to confirm the strong conviction which exists in the public mind that the police have succeeded in apprehending the perpetrator of these horrible murders. Among the circumstances of the greatest suspicion against Mr. Rush, we may mention the simultaneous impression produced upon the survivors of the tragedy of Tuesday night that the man whom they saw masked and draped was Mr. Rush. The butler who witnessed the murder of Mr. Jeremy Jr. says, At the time I saw the man passing the corner, it occurred to me that it was Mr. Rush, whom I have often seen at Stansfield Hall lately. I knew Mr. Rush perfectly well. The man I saw was like Mr. Rush in size, height, and his walk. I saw the man that I supposed to be Mr. Rush fire a pistol, and young Mr. Jeremy instantly fell back. The cook speaks to the same belief. The moment I saw the man, it struck me that it was Mr. Rush, who had very frequently, within the last five months, been at the hall. The man was short and stout. He held his head a little on one side, just in the way Mr. Rush carries it. It struck me, the moment I saw him, from his form and his carriage, that it was Mr. Rush. I have had frequent opportunities since I came to the hall of seeing Mr. Rush, and I know him in person quite well. I never saw any man either connected with Stanfield Hall or elsewhere that at all resembles Mr. Rush. In my own mind, I think it is impossible. I can be mistaken in my opinion. I had such an opportunity of seeing his person that I cannot be mistaken although I cannot, from not having seen his face, positively swear that it was him. Another circumstance which had been elicited is that at about five o'clock, a short time before the murder, Rush, who was walking towards Stanfield Hall, met a young woman and asked her whether she belonged to the hall. She said she did not, but that she had just come from it. He then asked, do you know whether Mr. Jeremy is at home? She replied, yes, he is at home. I saw them both, meaning Mr. Jeremy and his son, at about half an hour back with the men that are planting. He again said, do you belong to the hall? And the young woman replied, no, but I come from there. The above statements were confirmed by several witnesses at the coroner's inquest. Within his household lives a widow acting as governess, and most likely Rush's mistress, with her adjoining bedroom to his. Upon Rush's return to the house on the night in question, he is flustered and asks his mistress to state to the police, should they arrive, that he has been home all evening. She initially does this, but then, finding herself facing criminal charges as the noose around Rush's Titan, she backs down and confirms that he was not. But a most important link in the case has, however, been supplied by a woman named Emily James, a widow who appears to have resided with the prisoner at the Potash Farm. This woman at first swore that Mr. Rush was at home during the whole of Tuesday evening, except for about ten minutes, being questioned more minutely as to the exact time of Rush's leaving the house and returning, she did not appear very sure about it. She was reading a book which interest, interested her very much, she said, and it did not keep a very accurate account of the time. This woman, who is now in custody, has since confessed that Rush was absent from the house all the evening of the murder. She now states that when he came home he appeared to be in a state of great agitation and rushed into the house, saying he was very ill. He went into his own room and shut the door. She looked through the keyhole and saw him take off a covering from his face. The witness is further understood to have stated that Rush frequently went out in disguise, and that on Tuesday night he cursed the poachers, pretending to go out after them. Mrs. James, having made this statement before the magistrates, and in the presence, of the prisoner 
he was asked whether he had any questions to put to her. His reply is said to have been, No, she's said enough to hang me already. Rush is remanded. The feelings against him within the county are very high. Any kind of perceived uprising against landowners was taken most seriously at the time. Further evidence is gathered of Rush having told one of his servants to spread straw between his farm and part of the way to Stansfield Hall. It is supposed that this was done to cover tracks from his boots. From the Essex Standard, the 8th of December, 1848, the murders at Stansfield Hall, Norfolk. Constable Futter stated that he had seen a quantity of straw littered from Mr. Rush's house for a distance of three furlongs to Mr. Coleman's farm. This straw was laid down in a straight line from Rush's house to a broad bank. Then it was laid in a slanting direction towards a meadow, the purpose, no doubt, being to prevent any footmarks being seen. A boy named Smith on Mr. Rush's farm said his master had given him orders to lay down the straw. Rush's house is about seven furlongs from Stansfield Hall, and the straw was littered down for nearly half that distance. On the Tuesday night, heavy rains fell, so that footmarks could not afterwards be easily distinguished. Footmarks were traced in the direct path between Stansfield Hall and the prisoner's residence on the morning after the murder, but in consequence of the rain, the impressions left by the feet of the man who had passed over the ground were obliterated. Rush's boots were compared with the marks thus left and were found to correspond, therefore, so far as they went, although the footprints were deficient in the impression of the heel, as if, on account of the slippery state of the ground or from some other cause, the man had walked on his tiptoes or on the forepart of his foot. Any chance of Rush somehow sliding his way out of the serious charges against him vanished upon the finding of the mask hidden away in his house. From the Essex Standard, the 8th of December, 1848, the murders at Stanfield Hall in Norfolk. The examination of the prisoner Rush before the magistrates at Norwich Castle was resumed on Monday and continued till a late hour, and in the course of the day a most important disclosure was made. After a careful search by the police, a black mask was discovered amongst a bundle of newspapers so carefully folded up and concealed that nothing but a careful examination of each newspaper could have led to the discovery. This mask covers the faith as far as the mouth, to which a piece of black lace is attached, effectively concealing the lower part of the face. A messenger was immediately dispatched to Norwich with the mask, and it was produced before the magistrate. The prisoner appeared for a moment confounded by the production of this important link in the chain of evidence, but speedily recovered the same tone of levity and indifference which he had exhibited ever since his apprehension. The prisoner, it is said, inquires after the servant, Elizabeth Chesney, who lies dangerously wounded in the thigh, and manifests much concern for her situation. But it is observed that he has never once shown the slightest solicitude for Mrs. Jermy or mentioned her name to those about him. When taken to the bedside of the lady's maid, Rush observed that he was sorry to see her suffering so much. She remarked that she had no doubt it was he who fired at her. The Trial The case goes to trial, but there is little chance of any kind of reprieve for Rush. He defends himself, but there is little he can do against the onslaught of evidence against him. Mrs. Jermy identifies him as the man who shot her. The maid, Elizabeth Chesney, who survives the terrible gunshot to her, identifies Rush 
the cook and the butler identify Rush as they saw him moving about the house. His mistress, the governess of his children, Emily Sanford, recounts his odd behaviour upon returning home on the night of the crime and confesses to looking through the keyhole to see him changing his clothes hurriedly. A cape fitting the description of the witnesses was found on his bed. More damning was the finding of the mask, which matched the detail of the eyewitness accounts. There were also his wet boots, which had not been wet when they had been cleaned by the servant before bed, but were wet in the morning. The placement of hay upon the ground for some distance from his house toward the hall, and the matching of the toe of his boot with impressions left on the ground near Stanfield Manor. Additional evidence is uncovered of forgeries that Rush has made as he scrambled to find the money to hold on to his properties. From the Devizes and Wiltshire Gazette, the 5th of April, 1849, Conviction of Rush, the judge having summed up, the jury retired for five minutes and then returned a verdict of guilty. The prisoner, in a deep tone of voice, said, I'm innocent all the same, and God Almighty knows it. His expression, however, never changed for a moment, and he retained to the close the same sullen look from which he had listened to the judge's charge. Baron Rolf then put on the black cap and amidst profound silence proceeded to pass upon the prisoner the awful sentence of the law. James Blomfield Rush, after a trial unusually protracted, you have been found guilty of the charge of willful murder, a crime the highest any human being can perpetrate against another, the deepest under any circumstances of exgenation. But I regret to say that in your case there is everything which could add a deeper dye to a guilt the most horrible. It appears from letters which you yourself put in that to the father of the unfortunate victim of your malice and you owe a debt of deep gratitude. You commenced a career of crime endeavouring to cheat your landlord. You followed it up by making the unfortunate girl whom you had seduced the tool whereby you should commit forgery and having done that you terminated your guilty career with the murder of the son and grandson of him who was your friend and benefactor. More cannot be said. It unfortunately sometimes happens that great guilt is too nearly connected with something that is calculated to dazzle the mind, but fortunately in your case you have made vice as loathsome as it is terrible. There is no one who witnessed your conduct during the trial and who heard the evidence pr produced will not feel the result of that evidence that you must quit this world by ignominious death, an object of unmitigated abhorrence to every well-regulated mind. I shrink not from making this statement in order to point out to you the position in which you now stand. No concealment of the truth in which you may continue to persevere will cast the slightest doubt upon the propriety of the verdict. No confession you can make can add a taper light to the broad glare of daylight guilt disclosed against you. So, therefore, as society is concerned, the conduct you can pursue is a matter of indifference, but to you yourself it may be all important, and I can only conjure to you by every consideration of interest that you employ the short space of life that yet remains to you in endeavouring penitence and prayer to reconcile yourself to that offended God before whom you are shortly to appear. You have been convicted on testimony so clear that observation and comment are unnecessary. 
it remains for me to pronounce upon you the awful sentence of the law, that you be taken from hence to the place from which you came, and thence to the place of execution, that you be there hanged by your neck until you are dead, and afterwards that your body be buried within the precincts of the jail in which you are confined, and may the Almighty have mercy on your soul. The prisoner at the close of the sentence was immediately removed. He preserved his firmness to the last, and passed out of the dock closely guarded by turnkeys. He was observed by several gentlemen who stood near him to smile. V11A James Blumfield Rush was executed on the 21st of April. Packed trains of 20 carriages were said to have been filled with passengers coming in, especially to watch him hang. His executioner was Calcraft. He maintained his innocence to the very last. That concludes this episode of Sinister Saturdays, the Stansfield Hall Murders. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times. And I am Robin Coles.